Many devices and operating systems have built-in security capabilities. These primitives work alone and are used by higher-level security solutions. In this lesson, we look at these primitives and how they provide system security. You can download the script for this video by clicking on the card above or at the end of the video. Security primitives are building blocks that enable system hardening. System hardening is the reduction of or strengthening of a system's attack surface. They include memory protection, virtualization, trusted platform modules, cryptographic modules, hardware security modules, and smart cards. Let's take a look at each. A Memory Protection Unit, or MPU, manages the areas of memory that a process can access. In this example, Process B can only access the memory allocated to it. This prevents processes, including compromised applications, from accessing sensitive data used by other processes. Another memory protection capability is dual mode operation. In dual mode, a processor can operate in one of two modes, privileged or unprivileged. The operating system runs in privileged mode, also known as supervisor or kernel mode. User applications run in unprivileged or user mode. Privileged mode enables the operating system to set up memory protection and execute privileged operations. ASLR, Address Space Layout Randomization, is another memory security control. ASLR randomizes the memory locations used by processes. It mitigates the risk associated with the use of predictable memory address locations. If an attacker can predict application memory locations, she is better able to insert malicious code or steal sensitive information. As I cover in the remaining primitives, weaknesses can occur because of the way primitives are manufactured and the way vendors configure internal processes. Virtualization enables the running of multiple machines on a single hardware platform. It abstracts applications, including operating systems, from hardware. This allows segregation of application execution and data use via using virtual machines. This is a model of a discrete hardware server. All applications running on this system use the same instance of the operating system. When an application wants to use a hardware resource, it sends a request to the operating system. The operating system then interacts with the needed hardware resource. Device drivers supplied by the hardware vendors enable the hardware, software, and firmware interface with the OS. This is an example of a hardware server running virtual machines, or VMs. Each virtual machine can be segregated from the others and appear to an application as a standalone server. The hardware server is the host. The VMs are called guests. Virtualization is enabled by a hypervisor that manages the VMs and their interfaces with the hardware resources. There are two types of hyper hypervisors, Type 1 and Type 2. A Type 1 hypervisor replaces the installation of a host operating system. They are known as bare metal hypervisors. A Type 2 hypervisor runs within the host's operating system. Because the hypervisor manages the VMs and their interactions with each other and external resources, all requests for access or services must go through the hypervisor. There are three primary advantages of virtualization. The most attractive one to many organizations is the more efficient use of hardware. Many hardware devices perform one or two tasks. This can leave a large amount of processing, memory, and other resources unused. Placing multiple VMs on a hardware platform can make use of all available resources. This can reduce the number of hardware devices needed. Another essential business advantage is enhancing scalability. When additional server is needed because of increased use, quickly bringing up a virtual machine adds that additional server. VMs are images that a hypervisor can quickly instantiate and place into production. Finally, better separation and isolation are possible. For example, servers with the same required trust level 
can be virtualized and placed on a single host. The host hypervisor and operating system, if used, are hardened. Virtual firewalls and switches can segregate the VMs from the outside and from each other. The weaknesses in virtualization are the same as for all operating environments. The hypervisor and VMs must be appropriately configured and vulnerabilities efficiently managed. In addition, strong access control must be enforced. Separation of duties applies to virtual environments. For example, personnel having access to configure and maintain hypervisors should not have control over VMs. Those with VM access should not be able to configure the underlying hypervisor. The next primitive is the secure crypto processor. Secure crypto processors provide services that help protect software running at the privilege level. They help reduce operational risk. Secure crypto processors provide several services, including secure generation and storage of keys, high-speed encryption, and digital signing. Secure crypto processors enable tamper-proof protections of keys and other highly confidential information. The first is tampering detection. Secure elements, such as keys, are kept securely and can be automatically destroyed if tampering is detected. Shield layers designed into the crypto processors can prevent electronic eavesdropping on internal signals. Crypto processors can also perform hardware-based encryption. Since they're designed for this, they are much faster and relieve the central processors from this function. Finally, crypto processors can contain information checked during the boot-up process. These checks help ensure secure system initialization. Four popular types of secure crypto processors include Apple's SEM, the Open Standard TPM, standalone devices, and smart cards. Let's look at how the last three of these work. The Trusted Platform Module, or TPM, is an ISO 11889 standard. It's used by operating systems, BIOS, and UFI to perform essential security services. TPMs generate public-private key pairs, securely storing the private key internally in tamper-proof storage. They also use the stored private key for digital signatures. TPMs can also encrypt data in a way that only be decrypted by the same TPM. Finally, secure boot-up processes use signatures or other data stored in the TPM to verify the authenticity of drivers, OS modules, and other elements during boot-up. This is a sample model of the capabilities of TPMs. Generally, it consists of secured I.O., an encrypt a cryptographic processor, and tamper-proof storage for keys and boot-up verification information. For a more detailed look at TPM content and functionality, visit the link shown. Nothing is perfect. Users of TPMs rely on the security and capabilities of the TPM manufacturers. The endorsement key in the TPM is critical to the module's operation. It is permanently burned into it. Secure processes run on the TPM. We rely on the capabilities of TPM manufacturers to check and recheck these processes and their abilities to operate safely and effectively. Cryptographic modules securely offload cryptographic functions from other system resources. They isolate encryption and decryption services behind a minimized tamper-resistant attack surface. Some modules can enforce separation of duties by ensuring that some functions, like key storage management, can only be done if two different people authenticate to the module. HSMs are hardened tamper-resistant appliances that secure cryptographic processes. They generate, protect, and manage keys used for encryption. They also participate in digital signing and certificate creation. Smart cards with embedded crypto processors are widely used today. Organizations use them for user authentication, and the cards can hold keys needed for data encryption and decryption. 
This is especially helpful when transporting highly confidential information. Smart cards are also used to create risk-reduced payment card processing. Once again, organizations and individuals using smart cards rely primarily upon trust that the manufacturers are going to do the right things. Side channel attacks are probable threats against all cryptographic processors. Timing attacks estimate the time it takes for a smart card embedded processor to perform given instructions. By understanding what is happening and when, an attacker can determine what is sensitive information and extract it. Finally, users can lose a smart card through carelessness or theft. This can make safe smart card use dependent upon a coupled PIN. Well, that's it for this lesson. If you have questions, please ask. And until next time, be careful what you click.